I am so excited to sit down and talk to you guys about some of my favorite movies ever. These have been a childhood staple for many, but for me, I love these films unconditionally. No matter what the noise says, I love these movies. The first part of the video will be the first three movies, and the second part of the video will be the New Age movies, which is First Class, Days of Future Past, Apocalypse, and Dark Phoenix. The movies that I will not be covering are the Wolverine movies. If you want me to do a completely separate video on Wolverine and his movies, then I will totally do that, because that, in, it, that just turns into a full feature length film. And the one other X-Men movie that I will not be covering, because it is just so god awful, is the New Mutants, which basically has no effect on the timeline, no effect on any of these other characters that I will be talking about, and overall, it is a very horrendous movie. Recently, I just finished some of my favorite perfumes. I had two full-size bottles and I finished both of them. So now it's time for me to go on a scent-finding journey to find which scent is gonna be my signature scent. And by doing that, I'm gonna need to try out a lot of different perfumes. With Scentbird, I'm able to try a bunch of different perfumes without breaking my water. Wallet. Some of these I have tried and some of these I haven't. One that I was super excited to finally get a long time of wearing was Commodities Milk. This is Commodities Milk and this scent is amazing. It is warm. It is like almost like that like milky marshmallowy scent. This is how Scentbird comes. It comes in a little case but the actual perfume is like a little vial inside. Here you can see how much actually comes in a Scentbird bottle. It actually has a fair amount of perfume that could last me a very long time. This could last me months. I don't know about you guys. Mm, it smells so warm, delicious, and inviting. I like can't, I just love like marshmallowy scents. I don't know if this was like a scent for anyone else when they were growing up, but one of my favorite scents while growing up, uh, I used to get it at like Ross whenever I went because it was on sale, Pink Sugar. It was the super sweet, indulgent, sugary, cotton candy, marshmallowy scent. And it was so like, it, that brings back childhood memories. This is like a mature version of that. Like it smells so good, but why I wanted to show you guys the case is because obviously if I had this rolling around in my bag, it would actually explode everywhere. But with your case, you plop it in, plop it on one side, and then you take the side with a little hole, you put the little mister in, and by doing that, you can turn it to this one side and it'll lock. So it's not gonna spray all around in your bag. Twist it, boom. There you go. They sent me Confessions of a Rebel Cherry Bomb. And if you love a like dark cherry scent, like almost giving like uh, the Tom Ford cherry scent, this is it. It is so fruity, but still has this like grounded foundation of a scent. So it's a little bit warm. Think like cherry pie. Think like a little bit of like that cinnamony, like vanilla-y scent to ground it a little bit. So it's not like sickeningly sour or anything like that. It is so good. And I've always wanted to try a cherry scent because one time I tried one from like a dupe site and literally it smelled so horrible. I'm so excited they send this because it's something that I am really interested in trying out, but I've never had the guts to actually buy a full bottle of perfume in a cherry scent. These vials from Scentbird are way more than you'll ever get from any rollerball or travel size perfume in a store. This is something that's really good for any beginner that's starting to get interested in fragrances or if you're someone like me who kind of already knew her scents but wanted to switch it up and I didn't want to spend hundreds of dollars trying to figure out which scent I like the best or going through tiny little travel size bottles that actually never gave me a full on answer whether I liked it or not. They have over 700 fragrances that you can try from and this can range from well-known brands that you've always heard of like Prada or brands that you've never heard of that are worth giving a try and you might just find your new favorite scent. And don't forget that your first fragrance from Scentbird is only $8 and the next month will only be $16.95, which I don't know if you've ever heard of any travel size or rollerball perfumes in stores, that's way cheaper than any of those. So save some money, try a new fragrance, and explore more about perfume in general by using my code TREND to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Thank you Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. X-Men really starts that 
ensemble of superheroes within movies. It came out before the Avengers. It came out before Fantastic Four. It really does start something within cinematic history of ensemble superheroes on screen. The first scene of X-Men is the most vital scene, I believe, within the X-Men movies. I think it sets up a complete other tone that you're kind of not expecting from a superhero movie. It opens up with Eric at a Polis concentration camp getting ripped away from his mother and this is when he discovers his powers in a fit of rage and distress for being pulled away from his mother. He eventually moves a metal gate. Magneto's origin story is everything that you need to know about mutants in general and the constant war between mutants and humans and mutants with each other. The next introduction of a character is none other than Rogue, a super cool character in my opinion with super cool powers that I think they kind of did dirty throughout the movies. I don't think that they make her the coolest character that they could have. Basically she's having a little makeout sesh with her boyfriend and basically sucks the life out of him. She literally is like giving Dementor in this scene. She kisses him and he basically dies. The kiss of death, really. So cut back to another character introduction. We finally see Rogue on her journey. Basically, she's hitchhiking, um, running away from home. And what she comes to is a bar that's holding bar fights and, you know, whatever. One of the people that is fighting is none other than Wolverine. He gets into his car and is driving and then he stops and finds that Rogue is actually in the car with him and then they end up on this drive together and they end up crashing and coming into counter with none other than Sabretooth, which is actually one of Magneto's like mutants. Like he's super flamboyant. He's like got like super long hair and he's in like a full fur coat, no shirt underneath. I don't know. I mean, go off queen, like kudos mama. And none other than Storm and Cyclops end up coming to save them in their like thick, tight leather suits, which is like obviously the like least functional outfit that these people could be wearing but they are serving, like Scott looks so good. Like Cyclops is like, a very sexy X-Men. Like he is a very sexy character and he looks so good in these first movies. Like he's not super vital, but he's very cool, which kind of is like backwards because I think Scott in the like comics are, is actually like a really vital character and none other than Storm comes up. And let me talk to you about Storm. I love Storm. Before we get into any of this, let me get through my Storm like praise. I love Storm. I think she is so cool. Not only does she have some of the coolest powers, she also is serving looks left and right. Talk about hairstyles. Every single time there's a new movie, Storm pulls up in a new hairdo and she looks fresher than ever. Like I love Storm. Who doesn't love Storm? Storm, raise your hand if you love Storm. Storm and Cyclops end up saving them, which this leads to them finally entering the mansion, Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. One of the scenes that I want to mention is Wolverine finding out everyone's names. It's like a pointless scene to like talk about, but it just is so funny to me because we already know Wolverine doesn't remember what has happened through the last like 15 years, right? The only thing that he has on him is his dog tag that says Wolverine. When Charles is introducing their names to Logan, he's like, this is Cyclops, this is Storm. And like, Wolverine is like making these comments. And then he's like, what do they call you? Wheels? <laughs> like, why the fuck would he say that? Your name is Wolverine. What the fuck are you talking about? This happens throughout every single movie of X-Men. Something weird happens with Charles and the wheelchair. I don't know what is wrong with whoever is writing it, but they always make some sort of comment or some sort of weird scene with the wheelchair. It is in every single X-Men movie. They can't just let him live in the wheelchair. Basically all that happens in this scene between Magneto, Senator Kelly, and Magneto's gay crew or whatever. He basically talks to Senator Kelly about how God works too slowly. He's talking about how he wants to take over stuff right now. He hooks himself up to this machine that like rapidly moves around him and creates this like projection of an explosion. And the idea is that the this like warping machine or whatever, this like projectile thing, uh, turns everyone in its radius into a mutant. 
I don't really know how that works. It's like Cerebro, but evil. Fast forward, a bunch of stuff that happens in the movie because I can't talk about it all. Rogue ends up running away from the mansion because Bobby tells her that what she did with Logan. Bobby tells her that she must leave the school because the professor is really mad. That Bobby was actually not Bobby, was actually Mystique. And Rogue ends up leaving the school. This was a whole ploy to get Rogue to Magneto because Magneto really wanted Rogue the entire time because basically the machine that he was using, using that much power would basically kill him. So what he's going to do is he's gonna have Rogue take the power from him, hug up to the machine and kill her instead of himself because he doesn't wanna die. Logan goes to find Rogue on his own after Charles pleads with him not to basically saying that it would be the perfect opportunity for Magneto to capture him which by the way I don't know why nobody fucking tells Wolverine what Magneto's powers are because he goes in charging like he can defeat Magneto did no one tell like Logan that Magneto's powers was the ability to control metal that remarkable metal doesn't run through your entire body does it Personally, I would have told the guy that's whole body, his whole skeleton is made out of metal. I would have told him that the person that he's trying to duke it out with right now, can't. It's his only sole power is to manipulate metal. Like literally your one op is him. You have many ops, but the biggest op is, it, it is Magneto. Also remember Senator Kelly at the beginning of the film where he got blasted with the like mutant, like changer serum or whatever. Yeah, he like escapes Magneto's like prison because he's like jello now. <gasps> Like he, his mutation is that he's like a hundred percent water. The major fights are Wolverine versus Wolverine, which is Wolverine, but Mystique. Mystique turns herself into Wolverine. But Jean and Toad is so unserious. Toad jumps at Jean and Jean holds him in the air, right? She holds him in the air. She's holding him in the air, she's spending him. Motherfucker, he like spits this like booger cement at her. And it just attaches on her face. It just attaches on her face. And it's like this thick booger goo, but it's also like cement to where she can't get it off of her. What the fuck is his, like, what the fuck is Toad about? He can spit cement goo boogers at people. It was just so stupid. The best scene with Toad in it is Toad versus Storm. If you know, you know, this scene is so good. Toad pushes her down an elevator and obviously like Queen comes back because Queen can fly, right? She basically blasts the storm his way, like sends the wind his way. And he uses his tongue to wrap around a railing to hold himself there, which is really fucking gross. Storm comes up to him and goes, Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. I mean, I'm speechless. I don't know why, but that scene is just so funny. Cause like, I don't know what I expected her to say, but what she said just made it 10 times better. Logan gets up to the orb. The process of the like explosion projection of mutant powers is already happening. Rogue has her hands on it. Money pieces are coming in. The white streaks are coming in. She's like having her diva moment. It's like kind of a serve. Logan has just enough time to destroy the machine when Magneto is distracted. Magneto basically passes out. Logan passed out from giving Rogue his powers to heal herself. Diva down. X-Men up. Charles was hooked up to a machine this entire fight. Just like wasn't there. No help whatsoever. And the last scene of this movie is Magneto in the glass prison. Basically he goes to jail for, I guess, trying to turn everyone into a mutant. You know, um, oh, I forget his name, but Lizard Man in The Amazing Spider-Man when he wants to turn everyone into lizards. Like he kind of has a moment like that where he like just wants everyone to be a mutant. Like kind of having his like lizard mania moment. 
One of the most important characters that is introduced and is the very first scene of the movie, which is one of the coolest scenes in my opinion in the entire X-Men franchise. This is on par with like Quicksilver montage scenes of him using his super speed. I think that this scene of uh, Nightcrawler is just as cool. This scene also is a very cool, like monumental moment for like VFX artists because the Nightcrawler smoke effect kind of was like the like pivotal moment of that smoke dispersing effect for movies in general. So I find it to be a really cool scene. This scene is basically Nightcrawler going to try to assassinate the president of the United States. It's very cool. But when you actually have scenes where Gene and Storm finally go and capture Nightcrawler and go meet up with him, he's basically like, I don't even know what was going on. Like, Something in my brain was just telling me to do it. Because the president was almost assassinated, they have the help now of none other than William Stryker and his plan. Uh, he's like, I've worked with mutants for a very long time. I know what you want. He tells them where the school for gifted youngsters is and how it's not just a school and how they actually have a military grade jet with under their basketball court. And he's basically like, we have to go there and detain all the mutants there because the killer could be any one of them. And uh, throughout this movie again, they're very much implying like Wolverine gene moment, which like, it doesn't, it, it was never gonna happen in the movies. Like you were never gonna, it was never gonna be you. It was never gonna be you. I understand that Wolverine and Jean have this whole like lore within the comics and the cartoons maybe, I'm not sure, but it was never gonna happen for you in the movies, bro. Like it was actually never gonna happen. From what we see in the movies, you, bar you like barely even knew her. Like you don't know her at all, like leave her alone. So the pickle of the movie is, is that William Stryker and his whole crew go to the school and kidnap a bunch of the kids and you know, go after them. The people that end up escaping are Wolverine, Rogue, Pyro and Iceman aka Bobby. And Professor X is also taken by Stryker. And the reason why Stryker wants Charles is because he basically wants revenge and he wants to do this whole plan because Stryker's son Jason came back from school and he started projecting visions into his parents' mind and his wife ended up killing herself. Stryker resents Charles for that. And also not to mention, Magneto is still in the glass prison that we saw him in at the end of the X-Men movie. Mystique breaks him out by injecting some sort of like liquid metal into one of the guards. And what Magneto does is he senses it and he literally like ejects the like metal through his blood because his has so much iron within his blood. He takes out all the blood within his body and it like comes into a little ball and that's how he escapes. It's literally like one of the most off-putting scenes I've ever seen in my life. It is very cool and it shows the capabilities of Magneto and his powers and how far they can actually go. Oh my God, is it so hard to watch though. It just ee, it makes me like literally cringe. So one scene that I will point out that I think is kind of really funny is the scene where Wolverine, Rogue, Pyro, and Bobby are going to Bobby's home because he's like, my family lives in Boston, this car there. This whole scene is so funny because they don't know Bobby's a mutant, right? They think he's going to like, you know, a special boarding school or something. When he comes out to them, he turns his mom's like tea into like an ice cube and she literally looks at him like he is like the most disgusting thing on earth. Like his mutation is like a gross one, like toads. Cause there are gross mutations. I'm not even gonna sit here and lie and say that some of the mutations aren't gross. Like toad is gross. Toad literally like shot a friggin' booger cement at Jean's face. That's literally gross. And then like the entire family like freaks out. His brother runs away and basically the jealous little freak, jealous little freak, the little brother who's like literally upset that he didn't have the cool mutation that his brother does, calls the cops on them and says that mutants are holding him hostage, him and his family hostage in their own home. And so the police pull up and they're like, oh my God, like we're about to shoot you down. And like Pyro takes this time to like be the big man on campus. And he says the stupidest thing. It's literally so fucking annoying. He goes, you know, all those mutants you hear about on the TV? Well, I'm the worst one. He is literally not, he's literally not, he's literally not at all the worst mutant. You can't even use your powers if you don't have a light. That would seem to be like a pretty um, big weakness if someone just took your lighter 
If someone took his lighter, he would be useless. And while this is happening, Charles and Jason are having like a debuff to see like who can outserve the other. Like it's basically like a lip sync battle because they're just like sitting there like in their wheelchairs respectively, like looking at each other, like kind of having a diva off. Magneto is the one that knows Stryker's plan. He goes to the X-Men and teams up with them basically because like it's kind of mutant versus human at this point. Cause the idea is that Charles is a you know mechanism for Stryker to use saying that if Charles focuses hard enough and he concentrates hard enough on the mutants using like Cerebro, he could kill us all. Which is like kind of interesting because of the, you know the storyline that Charles has within Logan. Charles is still being out by Jason. He, Jason pretends to be a little girl in Charles's mind, manipulating him into telling him how Cerebro works. And mind you, they're also in this like busted ass Cerebro. Like it's like literally like a armpit version of Cerebro. It literally looks like shit. Like if you think like, it literally looks like fucking sewer version of Cerebro. It looks horrible. Nightcrawler ends up teleporting Storm into Cerebro, attempting to break Charles out of the trance that he's in. It doesn't really work, but Storm takes this initiative to make it really cold. And basically Jason gets really cold. And that's how Charles is able to break out of the hold um, and Kurt teleports them out. And the final scene of the movie is when they all end up getting on the jet. So everybody, everybody makes it out. We got Charles, we got Logan, we got everybody on the plane. Like it's all, it's all said and done, but there's a flood coming and they can't get the jet off into the air quick enough before the flood hits them. And what happens is Jean gets out of that damn jet. She holds the flood back with one hand and starts lifting the jet up with her other. And it is actually such a like badass scene. Like no matter what happens within Jean within these first two movies, like this scene was epic. I thought it was so cool. And throughout the entire movie, we've seen Jean struggling with her powers. So we see Jean kind of losing a lot of control and not necessarily like, uh, being able to maintain her powers within the movie. And this kind of means that she's teetering on that edge of the Dark Phoenix. And so she stops the flood with one hand, pulls the plane up with one hand and sacrifices herself in order to save everyone. And I wish I could have talked about this movie forever, but this movie is actually so good and I love it so much. And if you say anything bad about it, I don't like you. Um, I think it is like pinnacle. And the, the name is just so good, X2, X2. That was such a good title. I loved it. Thank you for serving. The last and final movie is none other than X-Men The Last Stand. This movie is very famous for many different reasons. Obviously it's the third installment of the X-Men trilogy. And this just kind of seems like a movie that is packed with everything and it should have just stuck to one thing. The movie follows two different main plot points. One is obviously Jean's Dark Phoenix Rise and the other, which is the mutant cure and the effects on mutants in general. Both are very interesting, but having both of those storylines within one movie is a lot to tackle. And I think that is where their mistakes go. And every single like big move that they do within this movie kind of just sets them up to not be able to have any stories after, which is why with the new age X-Men, they basically have to start all over because everything that they do within the last and completely ruins any potential for any other movies and any other like timeline that follows The Last Stand. Obviously this movie starts with Eric and Charles and their trip down memory lane and their first introduction to Jean Grey. But this is also aged down Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. And by the way, they just look so freaky. Like it is such a cursed image to see them aged down. Like aged down technology is already at 2024, not the greatest technology ever. It, when Last Stand came out, I don't, I don't even know. It just made them look the same age, but like really smooth and shiny. Like they still look their age. They still look old. They're just smooth. And Ian McKellen has dark hair. Okay. Okay. One of the most jarring scenes that I think I've ever seen is in this movie. And it comes at Warren, AKA Angel and 
this scene is just permanently ingrained in my brain because it is him in the bathroom. He's freaking out. He's like, has all these tools and whatever. And we're seeing him. He's like a little kid. What's going on in there? Nothing, I'll be right out. Messing around with a bunch of tools and his dad is trying to get into the bathroom. And when he breaks into the bathroom, he sees that Angel was trying to cheese grate off his wings. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know why that like sticks out with me, like to my bones that like, I have never forgot it. One of my favorite scenes throughout this entire movie, and I think it is like the funniest scene ever, is when Mystique is in a uh, hold, when she's in like a transportation device. One of my favorite scenes, and I think it's like the funniest scene ever, is when the guard is talking to a little girl and she's like, please, please, please let me out. Like, I just wanna go home. And he turns around and he goes, keep it up. I will spray you in the face, bitch. I'll be a good girl. Please let me go. Please. Keep it up. I'll spray you in the face, bitch. When I get out of here, I'm gonna kill you myself. Like, I don't even need to know that Mystique was a little girl for that to be funny. That was just funny in and itself. And I love that scene and I hope everyone loves it as much as I do. We haven't seen Scott throughout this movie because basically he's been mourning the loss of Jean and he hears whispers from Jean's voice being like, Scott, Scott. And he goes to the place that she died, Alkali Lake, and she's there and she kills his ass. She literally kills his ass. Charles is like, wait a second, where the fuck is Scott? And so Storm and Logan go to find Scott and they don't find Scott. They find his glasses and then they find Jean passed out with a whole new wig on her head. It's this bright burgundy shade. It's long, like she's serving, but she's passed out. And this is where we get a lot of the Jean lore basically, which is why I think it's like too much for this movie. But Charles goes and explains that her telekinetic powers basically kept her in a cocoon and protected her from dying. He says, that she's the only class five mutant he's ever come into counter with and in an effort to control her mind she developed a dual personality Jean and the phoenix he says that he puts up these walls to protect her from the trauma that she had faced in her life and from knowing what her true ability is basically you have no idea of what she is capable no professor I had no idea what you were capable of. Logan goes off on Charles, criticizing him for taking away Jean's right to know what is going on with herself, basically way taking away her choice and manipulating her this whole entire time. And I really do like this scene because, okay, if you want to say it's because like Logan likes Jean or whatever, and that's why he's like defending her or whatever, fine. But I like to think in my like little heart and soul that like Logan really does find what Charles does to Jean so unforgivable due to him being kind of in a similar position of Jean. Although Logan benefits from his claws being filled with adamantium and having metal claws, it still is like the most traumatic thing that happened to him and he didn't have a choice in that manner. Magneto finally reaches Jean where she's in like a prison transportation like vehicle or some sort. He reaches her and breaks her out along with the other mutants that are there. This includes the Juggernaut. Juggernaut. And James Maddox, which is played by none other than a very familiar face on this channel, Mr. Eric Dane. He just keeps popping up everywhere. His mutation is that he can basically be like a bunch of different mutants at once. Like he can like project himself to being like multiple, you know, people. He multiplies like the cheerleader in Sky High. I could use a man of your talents. I'm in. I just can't get away from him. But the point that's vital within this scene is not Juggernaut or Eric Dane. It's the fact that one of the guards that gets knocked out has the cure loaded up into a gun and goes to shoot Magneto and Mystique actually steps in front of it to save Magneto and loses her Mystique abilities. And Magneto basically looks at her says a thank you for saving. I don't even think he says thank you to her for saving him. He's like, you saved me. You saved me. That's actually really pathetic. You should have never done that, um, deuces. I'm sorry, my dear. You're not one of us anymore. Skipping forward a little bit, Jean ends up escaping. She was with them. Like they were trying to like study what was going on with her brain and trying to see if she was Jean or the Dark Phoenix, you know, trying to see what was going on in her brain. She ends up escaping. She has this whole scene where she like tries to like 
hook up with Logan. It's very sexy and it's very like, I'm Jean, I can do whatever I want. Like, okay. And she ends up going back to her childhood home and while Charles goes to find her, so is Magneto because Magneto wants to use Jean on his side to stop the humans from curing them. They have this whole fight scene. It's, you know, Magneto's guys versus the X-Men. It's all this happening. It's very cool. Like, I think it's a cool scene. Jean ends up going batshit crazy and she ends up like making the whole house lift up off the ground. She fucking lifts Charles up out of that wheelchair. She said, no wheelchair for you. She lifts him up out of the wheelchair. And as she's looking at him, Magneto is looking at him too. Logan is seeing what's happening. Don't let it control you. She fucking kills him in the most foul way I think I he could have ever died. She literally, like, he disintegrates. Like, speck by speck. He gets, like, poofed into dust. And it is slow and it is agonizing and it is awful to watch. And it was honestly, like, it was a very cool way to kill someone, but it was very foul. Like she was kind of foul for that. One of my favorite inclusions in X-Men and especially this movie is showcasing the complexity of Eric and Charles relationship. Eric kind of talking about his plans. Pyro talks about how loyal he is to Eric and how he would have killed Charles himself if asked and Magneto kind of gags him. Charles and Xavier did more for mutants than you'll ever know. My single greatest regret is that he had to die for our dream to live. And I really love when they emphasize the true frenemies back and forth uh, relationship that Charles and Eric had. Like they are great friends and that like, that relationship still is so strong, but because of the way they grew up, the origins of their life, like they could never want the same things. That is shown in first class from the very first introduction scenes of Magneto versus Professor X. Like they, their starts were never the same. They were never gonna want the same things out of life due to the experiences that they had. So the final scene is the Magneto mutants army going to kill all the people protecting uh, Jimmy, AKA Leech, which is in a room and he's like the cure to mutinism or whatever. And then the X-Men go up with like six mutants to go fight these people. But it's like Hank, Colossus, it's Bobby, it's uh, Kitty and it's Storm. And also by the way, this entire time Rogue that like, you know, great character that we saw in the first two movies that like we thought we, we would have so much more of her powers. Uh, yeah, she went to go get the cure. Yeah, she went to go get the cure. She didn't want to be no mutant no more, whatever. The final like scene of the battle is when Wolverine has to be the one to go up to Jean. Like basically he's like, there's no other person that can go up to Jean to try to get her to stop basically and bring out that side of her because the only other person would have been Scott and Scott dead. Scott's literally dead as fuck. And <laughs> he literally goes up to her and as Magneto's trying to stop him, Obby, because Magneto can literally control metal, he's trying, he's like stopping Wolverine. He's like, you really thought that was gonna work, queen? You never learn, do you? And he's like, no, I didn't think it was gonna work. Actually, I do. Hank comes up behind Magneto with a whole syringe of the cure and stabs it into Magneto. And Magneto's like, what the fuck? The entire thing that I made my personality about has just been taken away from me. I'm one of them. Like, what the fuck am I gonna do? Like, I'm now I'm just an old guy. I'm not even a cool old guy anymore. What the fuck? Anyways, Wolverine goes up to Jean and like is the only person that can get her solely for the fact of their emotional connection and the fact that he has the ability to heal himself. Anyone that would get that close to Jean would die on impact because of the energy that she's pushing out, they would disintegrate. And like, he's just about to talk to her. And of course, like the fucking like, government decides that like they need to shoot her right now which i don't even know what the fuck they were talking about and they end up trying to shoot her and then she just disintegrates them in like a little poof like it was like it was wiping off dust off her arm she was like didn't even didn't even like give a fuck like it doesn't matter if you're really that big of an enemy to her you go against her dust you look at her the wrong way dust you sneeze dust she doesn't care at this point. She just wants, to, I don't know what she wants to do actually. Like, I don't really know what she wants to do. Wolverine ends up telling Jean that he is willing to die for her. Okay. 
he's willing to die for her. He's willing to die for her, but like Scott actually did die because of her. Yee. Uh, you would die for them. No, not for them. For you. She asked Logan to save her. Save me. In a time where she's finally in touch with like her Jean Grey side. She's not Phoenix at this point, she's Jean. And she asks him to save her. And he stabs her in the stomach, killing her and finally putting an end to it all but also putting an end to the franchise <laughs> altogether. Like I find Jean's story to be very interesting. A lot of people like disagree with me on that and that's fine. I think the Dark Phoenix like storyline of her is very interesting, but the fact that they wanted to end her story within three movies is fucking crazy. That's the most interesting one. Why are you trying to kill her? And then like the last scene is of like Magneto playing chess because he's no longer immune. And then it like literally like it, zones in on a metal pe pe chess piece and it, it moves like a little bit and that's the ending of the movie and like i think this was like a horrible way to end a trilogy i like these two plot lines i think these storylines to last stand are very interesting i think the execution and putting them into one movie is ridiculous i don't know how with that many comic books and cartoons they don't know how to write fucking gene gray it's all right there for you People like Jean Grey in the comics. People like Jean Grey in the cartoons. Like what about it is not clicking in your brain? Maybe go back to the source material to understand what this character actually even is. She's a complex female character with the, she's the most powerful, most powerful in the X-Men movies. If you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and let me know your favorite X-Men movie in the comment section down below and which is your favorite plot within the original X-Men trilogy. I would love to know. Thank you to our sponsors of today's video, Scent Bird. Make sure you guys go click the link or use my code TRIN to get 55% off your order today. Thank you guys for watching today's video and I'll see you in part two. Bye.